Okay, hello all, uh, good afternoon. I am especially glad today because uh, we inaugurate, uh, in a way, our, our alumni lecture series. Um, Luis Fraguada, that you very well know, and uh, Ali Basbus, Aka Basbus. Uh, they are um, um, alumni of IAC, and this is the first conference in the n last years that is big, being given by IAC alumni. So that should be an honor for you, but it is especially an honor for us. Thank you for that. Um, Ali and, uh, and Luis, they are, uh, apart from alumni, they have been uh, working in, uh, in, um, in the architectural field for many years. They have uh, founded together the BAT. They are the BAT people. Uh, the BAT is the Built by Associative Data uh, Office and as well research practice. And they have been working a lot in projects in uh, all over the world, uh, but uh, mainly in Beirut, where they seem that they dominate the innovative uh, architectural, let's say, sector. Uh, it is interesting to see how the alumni of IAC, they go out in the world and they start to apply what they learn in real projects. Sometimes many of the things that we're working here, it seems that it is uh, far away from uh, reality or, or it usually seems that it's difficult to start applying it into real scale projects or into the, into the current architectural practices. So I am doubly, double uh, happy because uh, we have here a representation of the practices that we want to support with all the education that we are offering to you. And uh, I am especially glad because this practice is being led by, by some pioneers of, of IAC and some people that a few years back, they were just like you. So, Ali Basbus, Luis Prawada, thank you very much, and please help me to welcome them. Well, thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, it definitely feels uh, great to be here tonight at IAC, because, uh, in fact, everything started in 2008 when I decided to join IAC. Uh, I was working for more than 10 years before deciding to do the masters. So um, actually, IAC, uh, uh, so I decided to go back to school, as I'm saying, after like uh, 10 years of working. And IAC was my choice among, very, among lots of universities in the UK and the US. Uh, I decided to join IAC because, at, uh, because of the programs that the school was offering. I was uh, very much interested in exploring parametric design and also uh, developing some skills that will help me later for, you know, to start working and everything. So it has been a great experience. And uh, we met amazing people like uh, Vicente, Marta Malé, Willy Muller, Areti, Maite, I don't want to forget anyone, Thomas and the greatest teacher of mine, Luis Fraguada. So, uh, who's my partner, basically. And so, but the fun part really started in 2010 when I uh, called Louis and I asked him to, to join me working on a competition in Beirut. So what we have done is in a few days, we put together a team of 12 people from IAC and it was great. The team was amazing. Everything was synchronized and everyone knew what to do and did what he was best at doing. We had two main things in mind. The first thing is to be informal in our approach and try to use the maximum of what we were learning at IAC. And the second thing was, uh, of course, to win. That was like something easy because, because of what we have as tools. So uh, what we did is we decided to put a strategy. We learned a lot from our projects and we decided to put a strategy to overcome situations where basically the ideal of the academic world is going to meet budgets, uh, clients, like demanding clients, uh, city regulations, urban planning regulations, and everything. So what we'll do tonight is we try to share with you uh, something like the, the recorded history of what we were doing uh, for the last four years, because it's been exactly four years since we started the office. Uh, and I hope that you like it. Um, let me just mention that uh, it's also nice to be amongst some uh, collaborators, people we've worked with. Um, I think 
like uh, Vicente said, Yak is small, uh, global, and independent, and I think we somehow we also take that um, take that approach. Um, we have our offices between um, well. Barcelona, Beirut, and Dublin. Um, small offices, but uh, we try to bring together uh, as many creative people as we can. Um, so we're in Barcelona to also meet you, the people coming from the masters, people that are working professionally, um, but also trying to do this in all the different locations. But yes, as we see here, that is definitely Yak, as Ali has mentioned. So we're going to go through some of the projects curated to show you a little bit how we work, um, what we do, and hopefully this sparks some uh, good discussion afterwards. So this is our office space in Beirut. Uh, we call it Lab 33 because it's a, it's a running track. It has 33 meters. It's a small office space of 100 square meter. And it's actually a studio that basically uh, we, we learn something from Barcelona. This is something that I really like about the city here. It's after we finished IAC. Uh, we, we have a great network of collaborators, some people from the industry and some people from outside of the industry. And what's good is like where people interact and also the space in Beirut is done for lots of people to come and interact with it. Uh, it's also working like a display. Yeah. So basically whenever there's something happening, we, we bring a, a full set and uh, uh, of certain discipline and we display stuff there. So this is just like the project. Well, um, we're going to speak uh, about a few projects now that are located in what's called the Beirut Digital District. It's an area of uh, Beirut which is taking some, let's say, inspiration from some other projects going on, things like Ventidos Arroba, where we are now, um, and trying to develop a new part of Beirut that um, brings together innovation, um, people doing some cutting-edge work, companies, uh, independent uh, offices, all together in this new area of town. So we show the images from the BDD, as we call it, but the next couple of projects are more or less in, situated in this master plan. So basically, the, 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 the way we started this project is we had a client, and that was our first client, who asked us to start working on different plots. And then with a little bit of time, I discovered that the guy is actually buying around uh, uh, in the area. And what happened is one of the, his name is uh, uh, Talal, actually. And then when, some, when people started to discover that Talal is buying lands, they thought it was the Walid bin Talal, so everyone tried to, to uh, uh, hire the price of their lands. So basically, this is when we decided to freeze everything because he bought a lot of lands. And we told him that we, we would rather, instead of working on each land separately, we'd rather work on a, on a master plan. So we came up with the idea of the Beirut Digital District. Mainly, uh, uh, the idea is to, to bring companies uh, that are working in the media and the IT fields and create a hub for them in Beirut because most of them are professionals, Lebanese professionals who are working abroad outside of Lebanon and Dubai and Qatar and these places. Uh, so the idea was to bring them back to Beirut and offer them the infrastructure for us. So this is a good project because we, we started from scratch and we, we brought together a, a real estate developer, the Ministry of Telecommunication and different uh, investors into the project. So um, you guys are I mean, I teach a lot of you, so I know the kinds of uh, parameters you're working with, um, which are quite exciting. But when you get to this level, um, how do you parameterize a client's desires, budgets? Um, how do you bring that together and actually have it drive uh, projects? How do you take building code and reduce it uh, to uh, computational code? Um, which is exactly what building code is. If something happens, then do something else. Um, so as uh, architects working with computational design were actually quite uh, prepared to take any sort of uh, building uh, normative and translate it to our tools. So this is what we started to do with this first uh, plot that we were working with here we call it Beirut Heights. Um, all of these little numbers you see are just different conditions that we find in uh, the Lebanese building code. So this project has actually gave us a big lesson hmm. and th that was the, the project that's uh, basically, somehow we needed to involve the guys uh, uh, in the office here to, to work there. So the first thing that we did is we took the regulations and we started to, to translate them. And then we had some geeks in the office who basically decided to, to take the, the whole translation and say, uh, would translate it into a, a programming thing. So what you see here is, is a project where we had some parameters that are very, very important. First of all, it's coming between two zones, Beirut zone one and zone two, and each one has a different regulation. And number two is, let's go back to the gentleman. Sorry. So basically, 
what you have on the north side, which is the upper side, is the downtown of Beirut. And this is where the, the most exclusive area is. And this is basically where the views should have been uh, 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 towards to. Uh, the back part was not as developed as that. So basically, we had a challenge here. And we knew that the client is always looking forward to, to have something uh, as optimization. So what uh, this program is doing is basically it's taking this into consideration. We have uh, uh, three buildings in the program. Uh, one is an office building, one is a residential building, and the other one is a hotel. And the idea was uh, uh, to fix the square meters for each one of the buildings and, uh, and to run something that basically can optimize exactly to give them the optimal view for each one of these uh, uh, areas into the uh, the, the best views. So, so sorry. So the three buildings we have on the left, because we have one of the buildings that's going to go until 95 meters. So this is when you optimize between three buildings, and uh, above this, the two buildings will 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 try to calculate to have an optimal view for. So yeah, what you're seeing here is actually something. I don't know. For me, it's pretty interesting. It's using, um, say, evolutionary solver that all of you probably have installed on your computer through Grasshopper, uh, Galapagos. But it's using it in a conceptual stage of a project. So you're, we're not necessarily saying this is exactly what the building's going to be, but we're trying to merge all the parameters together to have the system eventually carve out. Uh, building mass, essentially. Um, this is right at the first step of the project, and it's something that now we do uh, quite often. Instead of waiting further down the line to heavily set up a computational engine to solve some issues for our project, we start usually right in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is like the view that you get when the buildings are actually intersecting the, the two masses. Um, this is the part of the hotel view. Okay, This is one of the restaurants downstairs. So this is, again, another project. You can, you can say, uh, you can talk about it. Yeah. Here as well, um, the building code is sort of acting to shape here. So we have some basic massing. And eventually, we have that massing. And all of the building codes start to carve out so that we meet all of the regulations that we need. So again, these are parameters that you know, you're dealing with some very interesting things now uh, in studio. But these are eventually things that will come at you quite uh, head straight on. That's, so basically what happened here is we came to the client with an optimal solution. And we said that this is exactly how you can optimize the views for the project. And then he, had, he hired someone, uh, an architect who knows the regulations and everything on the ground, who started saved, saving uh, uh, areas for him. So basically the first scheme that we gave him was already optimal in terms of positioning and everything. So we had to start back again to offer him more views. So what you see here is basically the building on the right side and all these buildings have actually more area than, than needed. And the exercise, again, was, was after we fixed the square meters, how to start eating uh, uh, the areas out from the, uh, from the mass to offer uh, uh, the views for each one of the volumes. So again, this is, we're trying to do something that has nothing to do with preconceived ideas or, or something that's related to uh, design um, aesthetics or anything, but it's completely based on uh, optimization tools. Now, um, this next project, it's also, you'll see that they're all kind of prefixed with BDD um, because they're all in this, in this area, different plots. And in this one, we learned a very important lesson that although we are, um, we love working on this stuff and we love uh, building tools, um, it would be an interesting thing to try to have the developer themselves um, start to work a little bit on this project or actually give, um, have a different way to interface with the developer and the people that are moving uh, this project. So what we did in this, a particular plot is actually create an interface or a little game or a little application so that the developer themselves can get this on their machine. They can start to click around. So you have a few different areas. You have the area where you visualize what's going on over here. So this is essentially telling you um, this is not necessarily the building, but the, how the regulation cuts uh, eventually and limits your elevation. This is a plan view, of course. And then this is a little widget that they can change the, the module. So what you're going to see over here, we have kind of like the apps on this side and uh, the presentation generally so on again, this side. It was very important. The client was, every time we show something, it was like hesitating. I think that something else can be done on this plot and everything. So what we wanted to do is, at a certain point, we were discussing with the guys. And we said that the best thing is to create tools, because the guy doesn't know AutoCAD. He doesn't know the regulations, because it's also subject to different uh, uh, spatial boundaries and etc. So uh, we said that we're going to create a tool for him to start being part of the process from the beginning, so we don't lose our time by changing schemes and stuff like this. So what you have here on the left side is basically uh, the optimal gabarit, which is a spatial boundary that's 
dictated from the streets and from the neighbors. What you have in the center is uh, the plan. On the plan, I, I click on V, it shows you the desired views and the less desired ones. The G is the grid, so I can have a grid of 10 meters so I can understand a little bit the dimensions. Uh, the data part is here. So this is like the built-up area, the maximum allowed, the FAR, the modules, and everything. And here we have a module which we can play with. Uh, what we have here is basically, I will, I will just give a small example of how this works. So now I have a square of five meters. Every time I click, it has also snap tools. It, it's going to be extruded until it reaches uh, uh, by 3.8 meter. This is like the floor to floor height, until it reaches the gabarit. And so if I can keep clicking, I'm of course scoring data on the right side. And uh, uh, I'm adding some areas to the, to, the, uh, to the building, okay? So what we can do is also, of course, we can, we can play with the module, we can make it bigger, we can, um, we can start playing with it to have uh, uh, like different uh, uh, things happening. And the coolest part about it is basically the client can start playing with it. He can save the state and send it to us. Uh, and what we, we can do is like, I'm gonna show you an example here. These are like different examples from the same uh, uh, tool where basically uh, we generated different uh, alternatives. <laughs> and um, of course, let me load another one. So basically the client will send it to us and then what we do is we, we also will, will take these and, and show them in a, in a comparison process. So we select the, the, the most ideal uh, uh, scenario at the end. Okay, so well, basically what's happening here is that it's going to, uh, yeah, we'll go to the one after. Yeah. so what's happening is as the building is starting to stack, uh, we, have we have built uh, the model of the existing buildings around, so it's going to start sending like rays until it touches the, the existing uh, buildings and start giving you some um, scoring. So the most important thing was the way we compare them is by floor to floor area, floor, floor, floor area, depth of use and quality of use. And what you will see here is basically, um, these are different generated things. This is like one of the schemes showing each five meters what's happening. And uh, until basically we, we put them together in a comparison way and we tell the client that here basically optimized uh, the areas that you have and everything. So what was happening in this scheme and was the most interesting thing is also we talked with Luis, the client liked the fact that we have terraces, which are areas that are not included in the, build, in the built up area. And what he liked is to, to actually optimize the terraces in the project. And uh, this is what we have done. So we used something like the L systems to, to develop uh, the scheme in a, in a different way. But that was the first intersection with the client where basically uh, he was really part of the, of the project. Yeah, and I mean, I think this, this kind of was a, a big bulb in, in our process because we realized that the, uh, just efficiency in communication, how, how best you can actually um, con convey a design through these kinds of small applications was pretty interesting to us. We'd rather have this kind of exchange than to sit in a table around, you know, talking to people that maybe could use something like this. So developing tools for people that don't necessarily have tools was a really interesting thing that we saw that we could start to, to do. We'll show you another such tool that was a little bit further developed. So again, this is a, a big project. This is like almost 230,000 meters of development. Here we have um, a hotel, a residential building, a shopping mall, and an office building. And the way it's stacked together, this is maybe the, our 60th version of the development. <laughs> and what we did is we, we decided to, it was like too hard to, 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 for, for the client to understand exactly, you know, the boundaries of the space that he can, you know, like something that can be accepted by the, by the regulations and the laws. So uh, what we asked the guys to do is to generate almost like a simplified AutoCAD where the client can play with and whatever he builds there in terms of geometry is going to be subject to the local regulations. So this is like uh, a video recorded for him to understand how this tool works. So you can draw lines, poly lines and close them. And here we're not talking about crazy nerves geometry. I mean, we're talking about somebody that doesn't necessarily draw things out. How do they get them to start to convey their ideas, their desires of what they want their project to be?
and all the time, something that we haven't uh, been mentioning is that all of the building regulation is built into these systems. So any movement, any um, change in the system is constantly going to be updating and showing you whether you're within the, the regulation or some suggestions to stay within that. So we don't want to be opening a regulation book all the time. We just want our systems to have that embedded so we can just design. Exactly. So also the client can save as a, a .bad extension and send it to us so we can open it and, and uh, uh, play with it. So basically this is the section showing the project. Also, it's very imposing in the city, so it's a, it's, a, it's a massive project. And it's part of the Beirut Digital District, which is, uh, here we're talking about 600,000 square meter between the two big projects. So this is uh, another situation where we'll show you kind of a different app now. Um, so the previous apps we've shown you are kind of more for developers. These would be also for developers, but more in, in, with an interest of uh, real estate um, configurations. So understanding how in a pre-configured core situation you can distribute different kinds of plots. Exactly. So. Basically here, the, the situation was we, we tried to cut as much as possible of time working with that client. So he comes to us he, with, with this plot of land that was right before the, uh, the master plan, where basically he says that he has 21,000 meters of area that he's going to put uh, stock in a, in, a, in a very important place in the city. So um, he decided to have a multifunctional building. So the first day he says, OK, I want 10,000 meters of offices. And then two days after, I want 7,500 meters of offices. So we knew that the way he's going to distribute the program is very important. And he's going to change his mind all and the time. And he's going to change his mind. So basically, what you have here is basically you have the lower part, which is, has the offices. The uh, yellow part is the furnished apartments. And the blue one is the residential area. So uh, what this, what this uh, tool is doing, of course, you have the offices on one side, the furnished apartments, and the residential as a program. You have it's something that forces horizontality. So whenever I create a new com calculation, it's going to, to calculate and, and uh, uh, give me new variations. But whatever I do is, is going to, if I force this, it's going to have as much as possible of flat units. Okay, also the percentage of balconies, what we are allowed to have is we have to, we can have up to 25% of uh, balconies in each one of the floors. And uh, what we have here is we can, we can control it by saying that uh, I would like more percentage on balcony in one of, the, of these areas or not. So basically what it's doing is, it's generating different, uh, uh, different variations. But the most important thing is, and this is something that's very hard, we have, um, the cores are in the back. And these are uh, stacked towards north and east views. So all the services are going to, to be in the back. What's happening here is, um, I'm going to show you an example. Here we have 8,500 meters of office spaces. If I calculate, they're gone. So uh, the way it works is, I'm going to, to divide these. I will say that I will have 4,000 meters of them to be 400 meter units. And I want 2,500 meters to be 500 meter units and 2,000 meters to be as a 200 meter units. So once I have it and I calculate, it's going to give me the new, uh, the new stacking. So I can, first of all, it creates lots of variations. The, uh, the parameter of the, of the building is limited, it's clear. So it's very hard to start stacking different uh, uh, sizes on top of each other without leaving voids. And that was the most important thing to, uh, 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 that this tool was doing. Um, of course, it can also generate to us uh, on a floor-to-floor -floor basis, I can see what's happening on the eighth floor, the 14th. So the client can say that, okay, I like this this module, and I don't like the other module, so we start canceling it. Uh, uh, it's almost like a recursive system. So Louis is going to talk a little bit more about, about the system that's happening here. Yeah, I mean, uh, in the same way that as you saw the towers dancing before, there's a similar system, but it happens much faster and in the background. So you get a basic setup of rules, and because the, the constraints are much simpler, it can calculate um, quite a bit faster. But the idea is the same. It's an evolutionary process, so it goes through a few iterations and eventually picks out the best solution. So as long as you define properly the solution space, you say it's somewhere within this volume is my solution. I'm going to go out and seek it. It's essentially what's happening in the back. And at some point in the, MA, in the digital tools class, maybe next term, we'll see some similar computation. So what's happening here is also, uh, uh, this is linked to an Excel sheet that the client is controlling. So the client is putting the area that he desires, and he plays with all the, 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 the things that are in front of you. He can save the program, save the, the 3D, load the program, and load the 3D. So this is like 
a very important exchange tool between us and him. So these are different variations where we're showing like you can see bigger modules, smaller modules, uh, uh, different variations of the different programs, so more of offices or less of uh, residential, etc. Uh, some vertical elements and some, some more horizontal stuff. So this is just to show him every time we do a tool, we, we send him a, yeah. a kind of like... Uh, we have to evaluate yes. the solutions. I mean, this you could be clicking calculate forever and you're going to get different solutions eventually. Um, we can take that out and evaluate it a little bit further. So this helps us to um, generate some desired uh, situations, and, but eventually we have to present to the client, out of the things that you chose, here are the ones that are working, that are working the best. And also most of the tools we're doing are serving very much for the first uh, uh, hmm. phase of the project, which is the concept design, where basically we have lots of, of, uh, of things and flexibility in trials, but once it's set, it's, uh, it's something that, that will uh, we'll move to production later. Something very important that we did here is basically we selected the view, which is, I think, uh, the first day view that we had. And uh, we hired a, a rendering farm that was online rendering farm. So basically what you see in the background of the image is all Photoshop. But what's happening is it's also related to the Excel sheet of the client. So whenever he sends something, he changes things, and he says execute. Uh, half an hour later, he will receive the same image uh, uh, coming by email to him, uh, basically with the new design of the building into the inserted in the old in the in the background. So this keeps updating with him uh, all the all the time that he's doing concept design. Yeah, basically, we just try to build tools that allow us not to repeat processes. So in uh, some of the previous tools, you saw these files that get saved or the client can save and send us. Well, we can take those same files and automate the process of creating a render such as this. This is an interesting project to put in here because it goes a little bit along with what we're talking about, how to evaluate um, property value, how to use that as a parameter. This is one of the first projects that Ali and I did together. And the main driver here was how do you take the main typology of, a, of an apartment building um, in an area which is not necessarily, um, let's say, you can't sell the square meters for, for so much. How do you take that and make all of the levels um, attractive, not just the highest levels with the views, but how do you distribute the value of the uh, building throughout? So again, this is what we did here, is we, we, we started by analyzing the data of the site. It's a, it's a site that's very congested in the center of Beirut. Uh, uh, all the buildings are almost touching each other. Uh, uh, so the client was thinking that in that specific project, he cannot sell uh, 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 an apartment for a value of $1 million. So what we did is basically we started to play to, to gather as much information as possible. And this is like, that was actually the first project that we did in mm -hmm. the office. So we started evaluating the site and uh, looking around the site for the new developments, how much they're selling it for, etc. So the, the, the big advantage here is we, we started to, this is where we started to use uh, uh, lots of information that we were learning, lots of stuff we were learning in IAC. So uh, this is the first, the first generation was to try to do the massing, but in a way that offers you uh, um, the best layout, I would say for the massing, that has uh, the back of our building uh, the closest to the neighbors and offer us a maximum of views uh, uh, to our plot. So this is the typical situation you get. Here what we're analyzing is the views in, on each level. And what you can typically see is in the lower levels here, you get some views that are being very occluded. You can't see so far. Maybe what you see are your buildings around you. So this you know, implies views, but it also implies you know, the natural uh, illumination. So what we know already from this diagram is that from the seventh floor and up, you start seeing the views. And uh, for, for the lower ones, you have some issues here because you have a neighbor vis-a-vis -vis and et cetera. So um, what's happening here is we said that, of course, the, the, the value of the, uh, of the real estate on that area is the, the cheapest on the lower part and higher on the upper part. So what we did is part of the program was to have some, um, was to have some uh, more uh, uh, exclusive uh, layouts of apartments, yeah. like almost like villas, which we decided to put on the lower part and these will be more exclusive, so already the price is higher. And something that's happening is the, the lower parts are the most actually uh, confronted to the, uh, to the garden that has underneath. So basically the first seven floor are going to be 
uh, more exclusive units and units that are taking a full advantage of the garden that's in front of them. Mm -hmm. And this is how we, we made the value of the lower parts higher. So yeah, the, the argument is here that we focus our design on this lower area to increase value because the higher uh, apartments are going to be valuable anyways. And what's happening on the, the diagram above, just what you see here, is basically this is, this is what the neighbors are actually seeing from our garden. And one of the issues we had here is we said that we want an outdoor pool. So we started to play with topography after uh, mapping the, uh, what, the what, what the neighbors are seeing from our map. And we started extruding the, um, the topography of the, the terrain to, have, to insert a pool that basically is outdoor, but no one is seeing it from the neighbors. And this is what you have here. So as you can see also in the, in the uh, apartments here, that the lower towers are kind of this Tetris uh, shape, but the, let's say the, the spatial configuration is much more interesting, and we feel um, much more valuable um, down here, because you have this whole sort of uh, scape that's happening, and as you go up, well, you get the views. So unlike all other residential developments also in Lebanon, sometimes you have like three types or four types of apartments per building. Uh, here we had 97 typologies of apartments, so basically anyone would choose the apartment that he wants and put it at the level that he wants. So that, that actually was a starter, a starter of another generation of tools that we created, which basically give a full flexibility to the de developer, but also gives also lots of, of, of flexibility and, f and, and, and freedom to uh, the buyers or the owners of the, of the apartment. So we thought that the balance is to let the developer sell as much as possible from his layouts. And also, as a buyer, I would like to have a maximum of uh, flexibility in my, uh, in my layout as well. So if two or three of the typologies that we're proposing here seem to be the most popular, well, we can also reconfigure the layouts based on that. And in a way that kind of, that you might think, well, that creates uh, an issue because then you have to regenerate all the drawings, but it's all built into the system, so all the drawings are automatically generated. And we also started to play with our own, with these, some of these uh, evolutionary algorithms to try to evaluate the, the best sort of layouts condition so also here top. you can you can actually the void is part of a garden that you can buy. So you would buy the space and you you can buy your own garden uh, into the space as a, as a void inside of the building. Okay. So this one basically is a very developed version of what we were talking about. So here basically we have we had a building, we had the opportunity to have. So one of the clients saw what we were doing, and he said great, let's do something amazing for my development. So again, this is a tool where there's a lot of interaction between the buyer and the developer. So what we created is a sort of system that works almost like, uh, like uh, it's first of all, all the units are exposed to the views. Um, and what you're doing is you're buying cells into inside of the building. So uh, it almost looks like, like you're booking uh, a space into inside of an airplane. So what's happening here is the tool is, um, works as, as follows. So basically, I would, I would, on that side here, I would say that, uh, well, my name is uh, AB, for example. I would like to have 200 meters of space. I would like to have it on the 20th level. I would like to have it as a duplex. And uh, well, for example, this is one of the, of the, of the way of, of, uh, of uh, uh, shaping this space. Then also you can say that I have eight hundred thousand dollars. I would like to pay for an apartment, and basically it uh, and you can choose the size, so it will locate you exactly in the place where your apartment should be. And of course, what the client controls here is he controls the uh, the price of the of the project. So we would say on the ground floor, I would like to have to sell the meters for four thousand dollars. And as I go uh, uh, each floor up, I would uh, it's an exponent exponential of five percent that increases uh, every time he steps up. So this is something that he controls, and uh, what you will see here is a video showing basically how at a design, a concept design phase, you can start by choosing, uh, filling up the apartments that you want. And this is coming from uh, people who would like to buy uh, in this kind of development. Um, yeah, the, the difference between this tool and the previous tools you've seen, it's much more based on the buyer than it is on the developer. So before, the developer was saying, I want 4,000 square meters of this kind of uh, program. Here, you have individual units. And so the, the buyer can really go into the system and see if, first of all, that possibility is available and f eventually for what kind of price he can get it. That's true. 
So after, let's say, in concept design phase, we sell 40% of the, of the building. So what the client does is he's, he would say, OK, for me, it seems that the, this type of unit, the 300 meters, sells more than the rest. So he would actually fill the data of the missing areas, mm -hmm. and it will start actually to generate w in between of what's existing. So this is something that's actually harder than the, the previous, uh, um, uh, previous scenario. And again, it's an interesting sort of kind of application to make. I mean, it's not the kind of application I think we imagined that we would start making, but it's really when we started doing this and uh, interfacing with these kinds of, uh, of people working in these sectors, it's obvious that they have no useful tools to, to do this kind of stuff. I mean, yes, they have Excel and they can organize themselves like this, but I think we can bring a lot to the table when it comes to creating interfaces for them to uh, do their work in a, in a different manner. And as you see, it's something that's very much relative to complexity. So as we, we go in our project, we'd like to offer more flexibility. And, and this is definitely something that's an added value for the client, to, for the owner who actually sells more, and for buyers who have more uh, flexibility in choosing apartments and uh, stuff. <laughs> okay, so the, the deal here was what we thought of is also uh, something that's relative to, uh, to the 20% of balconies that are offered by the uh, built-up area. So what we have here is we said that the 20% that you want, you would like to, uh, uh, to shape them the way that you want. So basically, you can say that my apartment is actually 300 meters, and my 20% are going to be one module that's extruded, or two modules, or three modules. So you have enough land actually in front of you to have uh, uh, one balcony uh, for the whole uh, development. So for example, the one that extrudes the most is the bigger apartment. And this one is going into uh, uh, one module that's extruded. So the way it works is actually um, we, we reinforce the, uh, the structure on the front. Uh, and all the balconies are going to be held by, uh, by a tension cable that is uh, actually uh, is re is, is related to the, the, st uh, the structure that's in the front. And uh, this actually creates lots of variations in the shape because we have a simple building with a glass front and balconies that are flying. So one thing that the client liked is basically he said, OK, when I'm sleeping, I'm looking on top of the buildings, and I'm seeing lots of balconies flying and stuff like this. And we said we can plant a tree on the tip of each balcony, and then you can see flying trees and stuff like this. So this actually helped a lot. And I think what's interesting to point out about um, this tool or the particular client that wanted us to do this is that they're not thinking, I want to control all the process, but I want my buyers or the people who are interested in working and living in this building to actually have some control over how this layout could be. So in a way, it's a it's interesting that we're starting to get these kinds of clients that are open enough to say, give me a tool where I can involve my, my sub-clients, my other clients, into the design process of this, of this project. For us, it's pretty interesting to work like this. Of course, it's not that the Lebanese clients are very open-minded, but we know that in this tool, he can actually get people pay more uh, money for his square meter, and this is how it works. So basically, whatever we show here, is also relative to what we're doing by telling the clients that you should uh, actually hire us because we give you an added value in the engineering uh, of our projects. So shifting a little bit away from the um, BDD buildings, um, this project here is a different program. It's a more of a fitness and leisure program. And we're going to talk about one of the configurations that we have here. So also, that was a competition that we won uh, maybe five months Very ago. Very recently, yeah. Um, what they wanted to do here, this is in Tripoli, and what they wanted to do is uh, they had, the client had um, a terrain where he wanted to have um, some sport facilities, and he wants to have definitely retail, and other activities basically that he stuck in his, uh, his land. But of course, the purpose is, uh, w the way they think there is basically that if I offer retail, this is what's going to attract people a lot. But um, he needs to actually activate the, the upper parts of, the, uh, of his building. So this is when he started to generate uh, uh, soccer fields and stuff like this. So what you have here is something that's completely uh, uh, based on, on performance and not on massing. So what we have here, we created this matrix that is a user's matrix. So what, says, what this matrix says is we have different users, which are actually distributed uh, as uh, users by age. And time. So, so basically, you have uh, students uh, from a certain age. You have uh, grandmothers. You have people from uh, so businessmen and different kinds of 
of, um, of users. And so it's also related to time. So every, every category of user will use the program in a different time of the day and the weekends and etc. And we actually also develop the activities by saying that, OK, um, a soccer field is actually used by a group of people of uh, 12, 11 people playing at the same time. And other activities are also defined by, by time and by uh, a number of users. And also, this is related to the retail activities, the restaurants, and everything. So uh, the way actually we laid out the program was by saying that if this is the platform, and it needs to be used during the day. So how can we lay out the, uh, the program by activating most of the time, most of the program at the same time? So yeah. let's say I'm going to be, so here, here we're showing different scenarios. You have the axonometry that's, that shows the program uh, with all the activities. But here on the left side, you would see, for example, a kid's party. And a kid's party, which actually, in order to go to that level, you have to take the vertical circulation, you start activating the retail around, and the food, and basically, um, uh, also, always a kid is accompanied by a parent or someone which are going to be actually using the retail, and also using the, the park area and these kind of things. So basically, this is, as I'm, as I'm saying, something that's completely based on performance. Um, so we, we did all kinds of, of uh, scenarios. We showed them to the client, and we said that this is the perfect layout. And that actually helped us a lot to win the competition because other people were coming with fixed scenarios and uh, fixed systems. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, essentially what you're seeing is uh, an activated version of the first diagram we showed you of all the different kinds of users, their activities during the day. And as Ali said, was to try to maximize the movement and the flow of the different activities through certain zones to yeah, make sure that the whole place is being active all at the same time. So we first saw the project more as this kind of uh, separation of people, um, what they do, what their interests are, where they would be going, how they could intersect with other people, and how that really could create a, a bustling um, space. So for example, the activities, we have, we have some soccer fields that are actually exposed to three levels in the building. So whatever you're doing, either you're in the gym or you're part of, the, uh, of some other stuff, you always have a, a view on the soccer field and, and so on and so on. So this actually helped a lot uh, um, higher make the values on the upper floors higher than, uh, than the client was expecting. And, uh, and as I'm saying, we, we kind of like activated all the, uh, the building during the, all the daytime. So a slightly uh, different project and kind of a little bit related to how we are working now and actually in our digital tool class, um, we're working into starting to develop new interfaces for presentation. Yes. Um, so this, what we're doing now, kind of started from this project. Um, again, this was a, a situation where we're intersecting various things. This is a project that's on a very busy highway, um, and a busy highway um, in Barcelona, it has nothing to do with a busy highway in Beirut. I mean, it's a completely different situation. So what we're trying to play around here is a basic module and using the geometry of this, uh, this configuration to start to reflect, block, and create a situation where sound doesn't get transmitted so much into the, uh, into the building. So we have here a couple of floors of retail, and the rest will be divided up into uh, office spaces. So first of all, trying to use uh, the parameters to shape the building, as we've shown you before. But also, how can we show all of these complex things um, in a different way to a client? So here we're trying to iterate again on the way that we convey this information. And we kind of adopted a couple of, of other tools that we'll show you here. So basically, this is, this is again, this is mostly um, an office building. And the module that exists here is a 4.2 meters module. So all the, all the actually, the small uh, cubes are from the same size uh, in the front. So 4.2 meters is a very uh, dynamic model for, uh, for uh, office spaces. And what's happening here is we have lots of noise generated in the lower part of the highway. So until a certain level, we, have, we, we can allow only 35 decibel of, of, uh, of noise to, to be inserted inside of the space. So this is why you have a kind of like uh, re recess inside of the lower, uh, lower areas, which are actually uh, angles that help us uh, distort yeah. the, the sound that comes to, into the building. Um, and again, so basically what, what, what Louis was saying about this project is we, we like it a lot because we, we, were, we had the chance to collaborate with lots of uh, other people. So on that specific project, we worked with uh, TL3. Yes. Um, Nacho, who, Ignacio, I don't know if he's Nacho, around. who was there. 
<laughs> and actually who uh, who helped us a lot i mean this this we needed to show the client uh, first of all the way that uh, uh, the project was generated and louis will talk a little bit about our um, about the computation part here yeah so here what we're trying to do is just generate different uh, schemes all the time evaluating whether that scheme is actually being um, going towards a positive solution in the reduction of noise that we have uh, overall on the building as well we have um, illumination situations, glare, and all these kinds of things that you deal with when you're trying to create a um, system like this. So this is the kind of the first aspect of it, understanding what, uh, how we can start to push and pull these modules to get different performance um, inside of our space. And of course, we needed, we needed a tool that has actually works as whatever you do here is, is going to be optimized in terms of working time, in, in production for drawing and everything. So, so what this tool does is actually, first of all, you play with the generation of the facade that is completely driven by the noise generated inside of the, from the street, etc. And as you go to a certain level on the, upper, on the upper part, well, the noise is less, then we actually created some kind of terraces, which are extra areas that is, uh, are sold out of the built-up area uh, for the client. But again, what this tool was doing is basically uh, generating every time we change something, we have uh, the facade John, we has we have all the, all the area count for the, uh, the the concrete areas, the glass areas. Everything is actually into count, so we don't have to wait for the BOQ to to come up to start uh, giving budgets for the client. And, and yes, I mean all of these things you can explain in a dossier. You know, slowly. Here's what we did here. Here's what we did here. But we wanted to try to experiment with a different way of actually arriving to the presentation and saying, hey. Here's the here are the options we've chosen, and here's how we're going to convey to you the information. So, so we decided to to go there without printing anything. So it was a competition where people were expecting that we have boards and stuff like this. So we came to the competition with this box, and um, basically what you have inside of it, you have um, the uh, the terrain, and you have three schemes, and you have an iPad. Uh, so basically what happens is you would actually plug in the, uh, the option that you want. You would take the iPad and you would browse it over the, um, over the model and it would start actually giving you um, things that are uh, related, that are generated with augmented reality. So we have three main areas in the app. We have an area that shows the data. So this is where we have uh, sun exposure, glare, we have uh, uh, noise generation and we have wind and all, all these kind of things which are actually uh, simulated into the building, uh, into the model. And then we have another one that has uh, uh, the data, the, the environmental, sorry, and then data. Data shows the areas in each one of the floors. It shows the projected areas, account of the whole areas, and a rendered view that shows actually uh, the building in augmented reality with performing, like uh, windows opening and closing, and uh, uh, and seeing the building from any kind of view. And then what you can do is you can actually capture, you have a, a button where it can capture the, the perspective that you like, and record a 30 seconds video showing the project. So, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, essentially here we're playing with the gamification of our project to say that it's no longer a book, it's no longer something that you can have here, but you need to actually play with it. You need to run around it. And uh, here we have uh, this augmented reality reality application that maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago for someone of our capacity would have been a huge undertaking, but now we can collaborate with people, we have new tools that we can work on and uh, do this kind of stuff quite, uh, quite in an agile manner. Sure, we also, what we also did is actually it stretched a little bit the boundary, so what we promised the client is every time the project, inc uh, uh, the project moves forward, what he has to do is he has only to, to download the new app. Uh, uh, the new update for the app, he will have, uh, he will keep track with, of the project. So as we, we develop, design development, we start to increase, we try to integrate electromechanical and different kind of things. So the client is always following his project day by day or week by week and, and seeing how it's generated. So all of this is actually in his kit, which he keeps during the whole uh, development of the project. No, and I can assure you it's a very entertaining way to, to actually do it. And we have actually, uh, we have been granted the, uh, we, we actually won the competition and we have been granted the, uh, the project. So this is something that we're developing now in the office.
<laughs> another residential building in Beirut. Uh, again, uh, we'll show you like, we, what we try to show is that we, we try to skip all kind of plans and stuff. We, what we want to show is how actually we, we, we're trying to use lots of things that we have learned uh, during our process and our work uh, process. And uh, basically this is one of the tools where we have to show, even if it's a simple building, the clients need to see lots of flexibility. So what you have here is Again, a, a straightforward building, and um, of course, each one it has 12 floors, and uh, different types of apartments. So the client would decide which typology goes on which floor, and this is something quite simple. This is maybe the most simple thing we have done uh, so far in our projects. Yeah. So here we're just getting each floor, reconfiguring it, and again, this is already set up. It's completely connected to documentation. Um, but yeah, more here was just a kind of an example for a client to see how flexible we could be with the different uh, solutions to the system. Again, so what this is doing here is basically you would take the, um, the apartment type and plug it into the floor that you want. So this is what's actually driving the shape of the building uh, that's based on, on type of uh, layouts on each one of the floors. So we're going to switch a little bit scales now, going a little bit bigger towards the, uh, the end of our, our discussion here. Some of these tools that we saw before, these kinds of evolutionary algorithms, can actually be used for also some pretty uh, mundane things like parking layouts. So even we like to have fun in every step of the way. So uh, something like parking layouts for me isn't the, my greatest idea of spending my time. But if I can run them through an evolutionary solver, then it becomes very interesting. And basically what we started to do is somehow we, we started the office by doing our stuff for ourselves. And then we had lots of demands from other companies to, to give them services that are related <coughs> to research. So this is what's happening now in the office. So we have built by a social data as, a, as an entity. And we have built by a social data research that's driven by Louis. And this is actually giving uh, uh, servicing other people. So what you see here is actually a, a big uh, land that was uh, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, it's a project for a company called Dar Group, Dar Al Handasa which is a huge company of more than 5,000 employees. So what they asked us to do is, first of all, to optimize parking layouts. So uh, of course, what we generate is a, a module that has um, three, it's actually a nine meter grid. So you can store, you can store three cars horizontally. And uh, it actually has the module of, of, uh, of a space for a car to, to maneuver, etc. And uh, so the first layout that you saw is, is basically showing how the parkings are optimized. And this number that's generated is actually the number. Um, then also they asked us to, to take the, um, the fire regulations of Mecca and try to work with them to give them an associative model where basically they have flexibility for the, uh, the building widths, the separation, the room, to, the, the room span, and, the, uh, and different kind of, of, of maneuvers which actually they can incorporate in their BIM module. Mm -hmm. Uh, model and this is what uh, what we have be generated for them so um, so this was one of the the projects that we did for other companies yeah essentially what they yeah as Ellie was saying they really wanted a way to visualize the consequences of the building code on what they were doing and this was a little uh, let's say application we made for them to to set that up this is one of our favorite projects <laughs> Uh, it's something that we generated because we thought at a certain point that, especially in the Gulf area, what they do is they actually spend a lot of money, uh, paying a lot of money to, to do a roundabout. And what they put in a roundabout is um, a pearl or a water fountain or something. Um, so what we decided to do here is, and this is in relation with the Olympics that are going to happen in Qatar. So what we did is we took one of the roundabouts and we developed different uh, uh, types of scenarios that happen there. Um, and this tool is called the 360. And um, it's a tool that we generated. Basically, the way it works is you have a roundabout here of 70 meters. So of course, we, we take uh, 70 meters of, uh, of diameter. We took 65 meters to, to do an installation in and left five meters for people if they found themselves by accident there. And here we have a field of acrylic tubes uh, um, that are uh, connected to the ground. And each one of them will have LED lights. So in total, it will generate something like uh, the field that generates is like a hologram mm. that's, uh, uh, that you can actually control by, uh, yeah. by, uh, by a computer. And so basically, whatever, every time that we have an event, you can change the, uh, the theme of the project. 
Um, yeah, so here we're trying to say that the argument is like, well, we're not going to design a uh, static thing. We're going to give you an option to create uh, various iterations of, um, of whatever you actually you desire here. So we give you a platform, and with this platform, you can create various situations. So this is a little bit of the background of it, but. And the idea was that, yes, as cars go around, somehow that becomes an input to change the installation here. And until we get real huge scale 3D holograms right now, the kind of technology we're developing to do this is uh, this kind of set of columns. It's a little tough Let's to see up there. One, show this one. So basically what you have here is, uh, this is, this is showing a simulation of the first thing we, we, we thought of doing, this, these are the cars entering into the roundabout, and we needed to see um, what effect actually can happen uh, once a car is actually trapped in the roundabout. Sorry, so I'm going to show you the first movie here, which shows... Um, okay, so this is the hologram triggered by the wind direction. So we have, a uh, we have a sensor that tracks the wind direction, and we can, of course, emphasize it by saying, uh, uh, by having more impact on the, on the, uh, on the hologram. So this is um, how the simulation, how would the, the, uh, the hologram would be working naturally. And of course, it can be showing any type of display, like here, this, this is the flag of Qatar, etc. Uh, the next generation was basically how to have um, how to have the traffic actually impact uh, uh, the, the hologram. And this is the movement of cars. So when, once a car is entering into, into uh, the roundabout, it will generate sorts of, of waves and uh, resonance. And uh, so this is what's happening. So we needed this actually to see how we can impact the hologram once, we, we are, once the cars are entering into the, the space. And um, the last video I'm going to show here is basically showing with some noise. So these are the cars entering the roundabout. And this is the hologram with the, with the Qatar national anthem. So once a car is entering, it's actually, this is the way it's, it's uh, uh, interacting with the roundabout. So the whole thing will be moving um, like this. Now, the, the thing is, this is not only what you see from uh, this is not only something that, that you would actually can uh, explore by being uh, on top, because, because through the field that you have, the field of, of, of columns that you have in front of you, actually you can see something that's really nice uh, by being on the street. Okay, so, um, so this is actually what you see being on the street. So this is going in the field of the round, uh, in the roundabout, and uh, these are like bigger pixels. But of course, this can have more resolution as the tube can be smaller. And um, so this is something that actually a tool that we've developed for one of the clients for ourselves. And this is something that we are actually selling in different places. So uh, we did uh, a small roundabout that we have to uh, complete this year in Qatar for a company called QNBN. And uh, the next one probably will be in Gabon. This is what we're working on now. So as you can see, we like to develop tools and have fun doing it. Um, and for now, you've seen people or us working in the Middle East, Africa, and so on. Um, we do have some clients here in Spain. Um, one of them is an engineering firm called Lanik in San Sebastian. And they're, they do space frames, they're fabricators, so they have a lot you know, in relation to us. They like to make their structures. And because of this, uh, somehow we found a common ground. But you soon realize that they have very similar issues to, to um, what architects have in their case. They fabricate, but they always want their pieces to be very self-similar. So again, in the interest of uh, fun and learning and doing something, uh, a really interesting computational tool, um, instead of saying, mm, well, let's try to give you different strategies to create the penalization of this, why don't, cre why don't we create an agent system that you can input any sort of curvy surface and start to create a relaxation of, uh, well, in this case, triangles is what's what they uh, work on. The thing is, they're great at making domes. They can make domes all day. They can make spheres. Anything that they can rationalize like this, they're excellent at doing that, and they've been doing that for the last 50 years, happily. But they 
start to get new clients. They don't want domes. They want something else, freeform surfaces. And you wouldn't you wouldn't believe it, but you know they don't have the capacity to actually do this. And this is not just small firms like this. I've seen big. Uh, let's say facade firms that really only work in 2D. So how do you give them tools that they can start to rationalize things um, in a much more uh, flexible manner? So here we created a system again, all the way from concepts to documentation. Um, these are the document drawings that go to their fabricators. So what the idea here was to create as few different types of panels as possible. It's a very common uh, desire nowadays for uh, paneling companies, facade companies, etc. So the system does clustering, the system does automatic layouts, and this kind of project for them would go in a concept design stage, uh, not even in a concept design stage, just in a, a stage to tell the client how much they would be, you know, be paying for such a structure. Would typically, typically maybe take them a month, two months, and now they can do this in two days. So these are the kinds of things that uh, we like to enable um, with the services that we offer to our clients. And funny enough, what happened is basically uh, someone was doing a, a shopping mall in Beirut, and we have two main companies in Beirut. One is called Glass Tile, and the other one is called. Uh, Alumatec, Alumco. So what happened is these guys wanted to to work on a um, on a steel frame uh, on top of a big mall in Beirut now, and they they actually uh, got in touch with uh, Lanik, who the client wanted to to hire actually because of the flexibility that they have in understanding a, a, a very complex geometry. So they discovered later that we are the ones who generated this uh, this these tools for Lanik. And what happened is, so now we, we, have, we have a contract for them to, to do this shopping mall in Beirut. And funny enough, we had lately a, a project that was designed by Zaha Hadid um, for Beirut Souks. And uh, the glass contractor is uh, Glassline. So they got in touch with us because they think that the, the, the design that was generated by Zaha doesn't have one panel that looks like the other. So, uh, so Louis took the, uh, the challenge and he said, I'm going to create a sister for each one of the panels. So basically, you cut 50% of, uh, of the budget of these generations out. So this is something we're working on now also in Beirut. So this is another project that was a service to another client. So again, this is for Dar al Handasa. And that was a, a project that we generated for their urban planning department. They had a big project in Jeddah. And the project is actually, they wanted to do, um, they wanted to do um, housing for the government and the army. So uh, one of the so in the program we had 350 villas for soldiers and 50 villas for officers inside of a, of a big land. So uh, what we did is we we were sitting with their uh, planning department. Okay, so we were sitting with their planning departments, and uh, we were trying to understand exactly how they how their process work and everything. And this is a kind of sketch that has been generated. Um, to show basically how how we can take the way they think and adapt it into computation. Uh, uh, so again, what you have here is you have a terrain that has um, a kind of canal. And uh, the first thing that we did is we said that we're going to generate uh, a layout showing um, how much it's actually, how expensive it is to, to build on that terrain. So what you see in white are the areas that, uh, that are less expensive. And what you see in red is like what's, where, where it's actually expensive or less desired to build. So of course, it's less desired to build inside of the canal. And they have a little hill uh, inside of the plot. So also, also these areas, whatever we're going to do is going to be disregarded from our uh, um, design field. So yeah, here essentially you have the areas which are um, most efficient to construct on. After we set up this evaluation, we start to deploy some of the core elements of the site. And essentially, all of the master plan will, will evolve around uh, these central elements. Again, so basically, we have five clusters and a mosque. And each one of the clusters will be uh, the hub to generate uh, some residential space around. Um, and one of the requirements is also, wherever the mosque is going to move, the main street is going to follow it. So here we're showing them different scenarios of, um, of generation. So uh, the first thing we do is we move the mosque around. And we see that the main street is actually moving with it. And then basically, the program distribution is going to show 
uh, the 50 villas of the officers on that area here, around that cluster. And basically, whatever you move this cluster, the 50 villas would move with it. Um, again, what you can play with is you can play with the density. So this is like playing with the density here. We can add some more villas, etc. We, we want to show them how it's very important to start using associative design inside of concept design stuff and, and uh, concept design processes. And th that was really helpful for them because they were working on a master plan and a certain point after working like six months, the client decided to um, the client decided to to actually stop or add some density to the thing, and infrastructure was already involved, so they had to to do the work from from scratch. So of course, what you see here is whatever we generate is always going to uh, to take our terrain evaluation into consideration, and of course, it's not going to have any developments into these areas. And uh, so that was like one of the tools we generated. We also said that the street, the main street, are going to, the, the branch street, are going to go uh, as a street hierarchy to pass in front of every villa. And, uh, and of course, this is what's, what the tool was kind of like generating for them. So this is a street hierarchy. Again, all the rest of the areas will become green areas. And etc. This is like really, really uh, efficient for them in a concept design level. The very first stage of the project. Yes. And well, that brings us to the end of our journey here through what we've been doing the last couple of years. Um, I think to get a maybe a better idea of everything else, um, you could check out uh, our website. It maybe is a peek into how we try to organize ourselves, how to organize the projects. Um, I don't know if we're actually going to get uh, the website to pop up here. Um, but we tried to make it associated. We tried to make it so you can search by location, by uh, date, et cetera. Let's see if we can get there. Okay, maybe not. So we'll show you to you uh, a little bit later in uh, passing. So with that, thank you. Thank you very much. So thanks very much, Luis and uh, Ali. I think it has been um, a very interesting uh, lecture and uh, in interesting vision of uh, how our students where our students can uh, and how can they apply what they learn here and now is the moment of the questions that uh, Manuel has one someone before Manuel <laughs> no Manuel no uh, for me it's not exactly a question it's more uh, to be sincere uh, we are very yes comment and reaction in fact <laughs> because uh, in fact uh, the first thing is thank you thank you very much uh, I was uh, very impressed of your lecture it's full of um, interesting uh, uh, for me uh, also I don't know um, feelings for me also and I think it's absolutely in the spirit of the yak in fact Luis you are uh, absolutely the spirit of the yak and Ali thank you to this contact um, Evidently, there is different key words in your lecture. Optimization is one of your uh, words, no? Uh, practically your words, because it's a very curious word. Uh, I think that uh, the lecture was uh, very linked with this capacity to, to have per performative processes of uh, optimization of, I don't know how to explain, strategical information and data in dynamic models. and at the at the beginning, I was talking with you. Perhaps at the beginning, I, I thought perhaps the the, the data, the information that, that you are um, to explain, uh, orientating in in this uh, performative op optimization process, uh, were very endo to exo. But and I say, well, perhaps the question is why uh, you don't have a, a, a kind of more crisscrossing situation between. Endo to exo. When I say endo, I talk about visions, vis visual um, perception, visions, uh, programs, uh, uh, functions, etc. But not at the end. 
more and more and more that the lecture was advanced, the, 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 these dynamic models were more a kind of uh, in between uh, devices, uh, between data's endo and data's exo. And at the end, uh, really, uh, all the lecture was fantastic, but uh, at the end, you have this uh, situation of a kind of interface between uh, the data that are inside and the data that are outside in a kind of uh, transfer of information, for example, in the iPad, uh, uh, this iPad, uh, I, I don't remember the name of the building, but uh, uh, this iPad uh, building, uh, I say iPad building, I don't, I know that it's not an iPad building. <laughs> we'll call it the iPad building. That's iPad okay. building, why not? <laughs> and uh, and uh, more and more, uh, um, it was absolutely uh, good. The other word for me uh, was uh, the, the word distribution, because this is, I think that it is really important, uh, this word. In, fa in fact, I think that it's absolutely linked with the change of paradigms of, uh, of uh, the YAC uh, logic and the advanced logic, the change, the, 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 the change of the compositional um, aspects of the discipline, of the positional as, uh, aspects of uh, the modernity, the compositional understood uh, as a uh, design uh, uh, tools and the positions as a typological or functional positions in the space to this idea of dynamic disposition. No? We, we are not talking about compositions or positions, but more dispositions. But dynamic dispositions is more distributions. No? Distributions in the space, distributions of possibilities, distributions of uh, processes that uh, are moving in uh, dynamic uh, uh, disposition, distributions, uh, um, to resolve their self in a, at the end, evidently, uh, uh, formulations of uh, formal formulations, but at the end, but uh, as a part of these dynamic models, and I think this is absolutely linked with uh, this change of paradigms. That is a change of, of the discipline, and uh, the last is, and this is a qu uh, the criteria, no? because you say uh, Ali say, well, all this is not in relation with statical predeterminations, but it's true that. Uh, there is something which is at the end uh, not so automatic or, or so um, tool or so, but there is something that is at the end also sometimes not exactly aesthetical or formal. This is the, the, the question, eh? but it's in fact something is subjective, not exactly subjective in the sense of that you are having a um, predetermined, uh, it's, this is the difficulty, eh? how to say that you are working with a, in a qualitative uh, option uh, to uh, decide that at the end the buildings are not anachronical or they are not, uh, I don't know, postmoderns in the sense that they are very contemporary, at the, at the same time they, they don't want to, to be, uh, how to explain, um, in a formal predetermination. No? This is, uh, for me is the uh, not the difficulty of the lesson because it was absolutely clear, but this thing that is uh, at the end uh, is not so mechanical. The thing, and but for me, uh, congratulations is absolutely uh, our um, to explain no? our spirit, our uh, illusion, this kind of uh, uh, approach. I think that other thing is that perhaps for you, flexibility, uh, flexibility is also a very important word, flexibility as variations and that, but it's very beautiful to say for you, flexibility is, pre is precision, flexibility is precision, it seems a paradox, but it's not a paradox, flexibility is precision, optimization is option. And uh, thank you very much, Luis, <laughs> thank you very much, Ali, thank you. and uh, well. What would you say to that, Ali? And we are very honored to have you. I would say it's, it's, it's really right, I mean, we, we kind of like uh, stepped into designing tools and optimizations and all these kind of things uh, uh, because of a need. Uh, somehow, um, as I'm saying, uh, most of the clients we are working with are uh, people who are looking for their mo biggest interests in a project. So what we try to do is we try to give these clients a maximum. Um, and of course, at a certain point, we have to freeze all these kind of tools and, and stuff and we, we have we, we ha have to choose materials, we have to, uh, uh, we have to move into the, the next step where basically 
uh, choice is very important. But I think we, we created a kind of like balance. Each one of the projects has a very specific uh, topic or important uh, uh, thing to start. And this is where the, the key thing is. Because, of course, it's all related to, uh, 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 to design at the end. But what we give in the beginning is an optimization, especially for, for people. I mean, a residential building or an office space and everything is like, you're talking about layouts, uh, views, etc. And these are very, very key uh, things in, uh, in Lebanon or but, the rest But of the, the word world. optimization isn't something you can just use lightly. I mean, you have to be very precise about what you're optimizing for. It's not just this is the optimum for everything. It's the optimum for, and that's, that, that takes a lot. And I, I think to try to answer maybe the, some of the last comments you were making, um, you know, just like the uh, scientific process is still valid to go from kind of a hypothesis to an answer, I think there's elements of the design process that are also embedded in there. I mean, we take different approaches, we take, but in the end, there's still evaluation, there's still uh, qualification and quality that you need to add to that. So I think, in a way, we, we like to play differently, but in the end, you know, there are some parameters that uh, are very strong and very forceful. Sure. Uh, I think an, another word um, that can define your work is accessibility. Because it's really in the sense that uh, uh, I appreciate a lot the effort you do in make the new te technologies, the new design technologies accessible. And to transform them into a tool and so the architecture becomes like a, the process of design becomes like a tool. Your, your web page is, a, is one more tool as well. So I think that accessibility is another keyword that uh, here in Yak uh, with the Fab Lab, and it's something that is absol absolutely crucial. And I wanted to point it out. Uh, then something linked to what uh, Manuel also was uh, commenting a bit, which is the area um, left for the architectural decision. is something that comes afterwards, as Ali was starting to say, when you come to the, define the materials, or it's something that is uh, the decision of the parameters. So there are some parameters that uh, you um, put under um, discussion or, pu or, or you, vary, you accept to variate, and some other parameters that uh, you don't uh, uh, variate. And talking about parameters, did you ever develop any tools um, where the, the construction cost was one of the parameters? Because uh, this is uh, something, as uh, when you deal with clients, super crucial. And uh, I remember uh, Frank Gehry, when, when he um, uh, the, inaugurated the Guggenheim in, in 97, he was saying that, uh, well, but why that, uh, that kind of uh, thing is inclinated that way and not that way? No, because that way was uh, 1,000 pesetas, and that one was uh, um, 2,000 pesetas. So in, I don't know if he calculated it with any kind of uh, <laughs> tools, I doubt. But uh, it is interesting how, the, of course, the, the, the cost uh, of the, um, uh, the cost is a design parameter. So I wanted to know if you managed to also um, introduce it in your tools. Sure, of course, uh, that's a very important question. Uh, what I think is, I mean, we, we all, all, most of our interventions are very key, uh, key, uh, key in the concept process. Okay, so during concept design, what, whatever we were speaking about in terms of uh, optimizations, views, and stuff like this, are very much driven into adding a value. So we had also we were exposed to other projects. Like we had, we did a project in China, a small project where we had to do a pavilion. Um, we had to refurbish a space that was a, a gallery, uh, a space that had, was a factory that we they were using like tubes and stuff like this. And we wanted to uh, to do uh, an installation for them, for this uh, for this guy. Uh, uh, we had a very small budget. So what we did is basically we took what what is existing in the, in terms of inventory. So we, we took the rest of the tubes that were existing uh, um, on the site, and we said that we're going to work with these. And all the budget, actually, the, the budget was the driver thing here. So we had nothing but the budget. And we actually did, uh, this project has a restaurant and an exhibition space. And it was completely driven by the, by the budget. So we knew exactly what to use in terms of material. And we knew uh, how, how much we can spend in terms of, uh, of uh, man labor. 
and uh, yeah, the also the the iPad building, let's say, was one of the clients was uh, the contractor as well, and this of course was super important. So, so again, the, it, it should be straight. Most of the buildings that you see are again straight boxes. Uh, uh, so these are definitely constraints constraints that we're facing. So no no much angles in every all the apartments that we're doing. We don't have any place where you have a, a steep angle or I mean it's it's all things that we take into consideration in the beginning because we know that later on it's going to to hit the wall and the client is going to change his mind or something. So we try to be economical. I think and this is uh, uh, this is something that we do intuitively because we know that these guys are very keen about money and then this is going to come at a certain point. So, uh, so again, uh, in terms of accessibility, definitely it's very important. We, we, are, we are giving access to technology not only for architects but also for lots of developers and lots of uh, different disciplines. Chefs. Chefs again. And this is something that's actually giving us more exposure for the, uh, for the research uh, part of the office where now we're having more work for the research part than the architecture part. Somehow, that all the architects in Beirut are trying to, in the Middle East, are trying to catch up with us to generate tools for them and to try. It's it's very it's very it's very straight. Let me be straightforward. The first project we we uh, we submitted the Isla Primavera. We went to the client and we had like seven people on the jury sitting in front of us. When we showed our solutions and they are linked to numbers, we had no one asking any question because we were giving them numbers. And, uh, and numbers are very clear. Uh, so this is a maximum of use. This is as many layouts as you want. And so basically, at the end, it's, it's not, we, we're not being greedy in, in anything. And we're giving only added values uh, uh, as solutions. And again, this, this range of studies can, can go to any kinds of parameters. So budgets, uh, heights, uh, uh, all kinds of things. Material cost. Yes. presentation I uh, really appreciate it um, I think in the same topic as she's saying like what is the role of the architect in this um, in this uh, all this process of creating tools um, I think as you said you have a um, kind of uh, optimization for goal and this goal seems to be first to catch a project that's it seems for you it's an important <laughs> goal yes um, effectively a good goal um, then I think that you have also some some drivers um, and hopefully also one of it is also to, uh, to push for better architecture and try to, um, to teach that it's not incompatible with actually uh, adding value to the building. Um, I'm surprised that actually you don't show so much about environment and about saving on energy, uh, something that still is not yet so much in the culture of people and could be teach maybe with these tools? Is it too complicated or not they easy all, to show? They all incorporated, we just didn't talk about it. I mean, okay. yeah. it's all, you know, every iteration goes through a solar analysis, a glare analysis, a natural illumination analysis, so it's kind of, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a good point. It's but actually integrated, definitely. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, so far what we have showed you here are now we're actually building two projects uh, uh, in Beirut, and these are basically where we developed more uh, the environmental part because we're we're trying to target to target lead efficiency, the, uh, gold lead uh, rating, and of course the positioning of the uh, of our projects towards the sun, uh, again visibility, uh, exposure, glare, all that, all, all these are very important elements that we take into consideration. Now, in relation to the where do we uh, does the architects intervene? Uh, I think that's, I don't know, I, would, I don't want to say it's happening intuitively, but again, what we're trying to do is trying to satisfy all these factors uh, and parameters we're talking about, which are related to budget orientation, uh, uh, very important parameters uh, related to a project uh, efficiency. Uh, I mean, this, what, what, what Lou is showing here is, is part of, of, uh, of these kind of, uh, of things. But, uh, Again, basically, we, we at a certain point during concept design, we, we freeze these and we say this is the, this is something that's set. We have the acceptance from the client, and in, we we can generate I mean thousands of, of possibilities. But this is where we we say okay, this is, looks nicer than if we use it here, or this is more dynamic or whatever. And we show this to the client, and the clients will always choose something that that we also uh, convey with. 
And I think that, I mean, I'm trying to be very superficial with it, but, but definitely this is something important. <laughs> No, but I think you show quite quickly, clearly that um, I don't know this kind of fashion around parametric architecture and generally we see it only from our side, but it's actually uh, quite nice that you design I think, the logic of the building sure. uh, without actually f closing uh, all the opportunity or the um, exit of this uh, logic, all the solution possible. So it's quite nice that you give it uh, to the client to play with. Mm -hmm. Did you end up with a solution that actually you didn't like out of your logics? No, because I mean, in the end, since we built the tool, it's in a way anything that comes out of it. It's like, oh, that's that's cute, you know. That's that's cute. That that's the, what the client chose, you know. So in the, in a way, we're we're always content. We we always want to be like a Zaha, and design fluid things and stuff like this. But but again, and this is where the <laughs> separation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is basically, uh, again, this is, this is all related and, and what we try to do is uh, uh, try to use the tools and also think you know, about uh, uh, solutions that, that we accept, basically. Thank you. Edouard. Um, yeah, I was very impressed. I enjoyed it a lot. I loved, uh, I love the talk, and uh, I'm impressed by the quantity of, uh, of projects that you that you come. Maybe my question is is going a bit in the in a similar direction as the um, as the one that uh, that Manuel asked. Um, I feel like um, often you can say that uh, that the quality of a project depends, uh, of course, on the the quality of the architectural work that is being produced, but also on the quality of the client. No, when when you get a very strong client. Often you get then a very good, uh, a very strong project that results out of it, um, and I find it's interesting the way that you that you treat the relationship to the to the client, um, and I find sometimes this this notion of the optimization and this notion of, of working with a kind of set of complex parameters, but also in a way the parameters that we that we know, no, that we kind of normally work with and to to try to work them through the code, sometimes um, leads. I have a feeling to you as an architect or as a team of architects actually disappearing. Um, and almost it's, it's, I have a feeling sometimes you're giving too much to the client, um, trying to understand so much his, his needs, his necessities, his economy, his situation, his program, that sometimes as a, as a kind of architect I find you, you're almost hiding behind these parameters. And I think when a client comes to an architect it's, it's because he wants a technical piece of work being done, but he also wants um, a character, no? in a way he also wants a person and he also wants somebody that has a certain touch. Um, so my question goes uh, a little bit in, in that direction and I would like to say that for me the, the project that I most enjoyed um, is the Doha project. And I have a feeling, I don't know if I'm right on, or not, but I have a feeling it's maybe the only project you showed us that doesn't really have a client. That's no? true. And that's in a way the project where I, I most see you guys. I, I, I feel desire uh, most, I have a feeling. Well, that's... That's solely totally true. Uh, we think that in the beginning, the, the best way to attract the client, I mean, there's a lot of clients and a lot of architects. So architects are uh, everywhere. Uh, so for us, a key was, is always to, to tackle the client. We need to give him something that he likes. So there's something of whatever he has in mind in there in terms of, again, budgets, in terms of uh, uh, the, the, the rendering of his, uh, how do you say, the rentability uh, uh, or the physical, uh, you know, uh, material part of his project, so it's fulfilled. But everything, all the solutions that you saw are things that, I mean, we have, we have different ways to, uh, to, uh, to generate it, but we always show solutions that actually we accept as architects to show him. So there's always like, whenever we show something, I mean, we, we have lots of discussions, Louis and I, Louis is, is, is taking care of a lot of, of the, the process of generating things. And, uh, and basically we intersect and we say, okay, we kill some options and we, we always take the option that are, is actually satisfying for us uh, uh, in terms of architects and something that we know how we can push forward and, and develop further. So there's also, I mean, definitely uh, uh, we have, um, I would say, uh, the philosophy in the office is, is to give the clients what they want. And I think that this is something that's making us successful 
um, in the uh, on, on the market because we have uh, a yes but definitely this is coming from from our will because we think it's a challenge to to actually make someone say yes to what you do and being satisfied ourselves as well but I think to counteract that a little not to counteract that but I think we also do it in a in a way that we learn through the process and we entertain ourselves through the process, which I think is also pretty pretty important. And another thing is that not every client's gonna pick up one of these things and start clicking around. I mean, we have been very uh, lucky to be able to find clients that actually become collaborators um, and not just, you know, this is what I want, you know, give me a month and hand it over. So I think this has also been sure. pretty strategic and pretty important. Um, and in the end, I feel right now, maybe what we set up is a way for us to curate to sort of trim and snip and eventually get to a, a bouquet that we, uh, again, as Ali said, we have to eventually say that this is what we want to represent us. So it's not just like, well, this is what uh, was spit out by, by the machine, but you know, we set it up in a way that we know that we're gonna get solutions that we can improve and we can cure it in the end. So, so I think it's really the intersection of our desire and, uh, and fulfilling the, the client's needs. So. I, I don't. I don't want to call it prostitution because we're doing something that we like. Yeah. <laughs> as long as you like it. <laughs> yes. Um, oh, I have a question too. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank oh. you, guys. Uh, it's great to see you, and I'm very proud. I've been also an insider and and a collaborator. Of, yes. <laughs> So, um, very, very impressive work and congratulations. Um, I just wanted to make a comment continuing this kind of um, uh, reflection. Um, uh, one of the phrases that is perhaps um, the most uh, interesting question over the last, I don't know, 50 years is Cedric Price when he says, uh, if technology is the answer, what is the question? Um, when I saw your, your presentation, um, I was constantly going back to that reflection and saying and seeing that you guys are actively kind of asking questions. I mean, behind all of these tools and all of this um, amazing ability with technology, I think what you're doing is trying to find questions and really formulate questions. And um, in a way, um, in a way, what, what um, I really uh, like about the, the work is that you're kind of rephrasing really the, the work of the architect. Rather than being this figure top down, and you're kind of repositioning your practice to, to operate in a different manner. And I really, I really appreciate that because I think that this is something that is not um, very common in the practice of architecture. We're trained to see the architect as this figure of, you know, with all the willpower and the wisdom and the, um, so in a way, I think that your approach is very, to me, is very interesting. Um, as, a, and as you describe, it's more as a, as a mediator um, than, than anything else. And I think that it, that's really where your strength is. I will ask you not to lose that. Uh, if you become rich and famous and, you know, <laughs> um, I hope that you stay operating in that, in that realm. Um, and my question is, um, to you, is where would you like to take this from here? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, that's a good question, because of course we reflect with what is happening currently in the office, what we're doing, the projects that we're working on, but I mean, I think maybe it goes back to maybe something that Sylvia said about accessibility, um, seeing that working through technological means maybe, but not really. I mean, I think, yes, maybe efficiency would be different with some of the tools that we do, but I mean, I think it's also we're trying to set up a way for us to think about how to organize the project. But, you know, working with other people that need access to, or maybe don't know that they need access to these tools, but as Ali briefly mentioned, uh, working with, I don't know, in the culinary world, you know, why does the chef need CAD, or why does the chef need uh, optimization tools? I don't know, but maybe they could, and that could be an interesting intersection. Bringing this to other sectors like uh, fashion, or 
you know, how, what tools are out there, what sectors are out there, what kind of people are out there that um, would want to use an evolutionary solver to solve something, I don't know. And I think it's not necessarily the scope for the entire office, but through those questions that you're saying and through those interactions, come back other things into, you know, return, bounce back ideas into the office that we could never have imagined. So the materiality of, of gastronomy and the, the time spans, um, learning about that chefs, you know, if, if architects are masters of maybe 2 and 3D, you know, chefs are masters of 4D, you know, they skip the third dimension and they have to organize um, multiple materials, they cook at different temperatures and they have to arrive at your plate at the same time. So can we learn from that kind of, kind of, uh, so that's, in the way where I take it is, is kind of there, where, where else can I ask these questions? I think that uh, the, the, the idea of learning was very important and I think this is naturally a key of things that are happening in the office. The way uh, things are progressing is are basically, uh, and this is natural, so I'm just remind, remembering the, uh, the question. So uh, basically we are, we are doing more and more what we like, and we are learning a lot from our projects and trying to develop them more. And we're trying to collaborate with more people that have extra knowledge in different things and trying to bring them to what we're doing. So somehow there's the knowledge part that's getting bigger, and uh, at the same time, uh, uh, the exposure to more projects and, and uh, so I think that that's it. Uh, it's, it's evolving somehow in, um, in the way that we want to go indirectly, but uh, uh, I think that we were trying to summarize what has been happening in the last four years, Louis and I, and I think that uh, um, we arriving in a place where we, we were not at all planning to be here, and it's very successful for us, and, uh, and I think it's, it's something that's fulfilling from all kinds of perspectives. Any other questions? No? No other questions? Okay, so thanks a lot to Thank you. Ali and Louis.